here two years two years ago when i gave my job talk at columbia where i spoke on a similar issue but it's a little easier task today because i don't have to weave in a discussion of garbage with my management style so although my critics will say my management is garbage but anyway um this is really an important topic for me because uh, as deborah said i've been working on this for so very long but actually the more i think about this this goes all the way back to when i was a kid um when i was in elementary school my mother was one of the um i don't know what wave of environmental activists you would call her but she and my neighbors were orga organized to fight the placement of a dump uh very near my home that was on a freshwater drinking uh, an aquifer for fresh water in my hometown so my mother dragged um, me around and sometimes my little brother and we would go to hearings and meetings and i learned a great deal at a young age about the environment um, and when I went to college, I learned even more because I came home from college one weekend to discover that this place that had been safe um, was a toxic waste dump, uh, a for-profit toxic waste dump. And that's the subject of a different lecture and a different book. But it ties into what I really want to talk about today, which is the, the intimate relationship between water and waste disposal. Um, and more importantly, I'm going to talk about urbanization of the ocean. And most people don't think that water can be urbanized or, or water, you know, spaces with water. So urbanization does not stop at the shore. And in a way, I want you to think about, um, and I'll get back to this at the end of the lecture, that waste in the ocean is really a form of urban sprawl. Um, and this is combining my interests in urban studies and in urban history with the environment. And I find that the two mesh very well with each other. Um, or at least as a way to study um, the ways in which the human beings have modified the natural environment in the coastal zone. So um, I will hopefully prove this. If not, you can, you can call me on it when we have a question and answer period. I, I'm going to try to speak for about 30, 35 minutes um, and then open it up for larger questions. So I, I, I apologize. <coughs> There's going to be quite a bit of text here just at the beginning, but I think that it'll, it'll flow once the photographs start coming in and some video clips, which I'll decide which ones to show. So this, um, here I was on, on, my, on a sabbatical one. This was in December 2009, and um, I was in Australia. I was enjoying the um, vineyards of South Australia, trying to forget all about academia, because I was on sabbatical. Uh, so for those who are professors, you know how fun that is. Um, and I ran across this, I went to an exhibit called Life in the Deep, the World um, of the Deep Sea School deep sea world of this giant squid. And I was blown away by this, this factoid panel that was on a, you know, one of these staircases going up to the different level. And it says, every year, three times as much rubbish is dumped in the world's oceans as the weight of fish caught. Now, I'm somebody who studied solid waste management for several decades, and this blew me away. Um, so I thought to myself, that's absolutely astounding. Um, and I wrote to the museum when I got home, and, and sure enough, this, is, this comes from the work of, a, of, a, of an oceanographer, um, Dr. Gr Greg Roos, who's a marine biologist at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. And I thought about this, and this really forms the central issue um, about the future of the seas. Um, and it's a startling statistic, and I asked myself, is this really true? And it comes down to a few very important questions. One. What is meant by rubbish? And I'll tell you that the word rubbish has different meanings in different places in the English-speaking world, and also different centuries. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in ocean dumping off the coast of New York City in the late 19th, early 20th century. So also, how would you even go, in, go about proving this? Well, let's, let's think about what this means. So what does three times the weight of fish caught actually equal? Well, in 2012, the wild fish harvest was 90 million metric tons. That comes to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. So three times 90 million is 270 million metric tons. That's even more than the 2011 output of solid waste produced in the United States. That's a lot of garbage. So I was, I'm blown away by this statistic. And, and, and you know, is it true? Well, I don't really doubt that it's true. That I, you know, I think that it is true, but. Rubbish, um, we'll have to work about, on defining exactly what is meant by the term. And, and for this lecture, I'm going to talk about um, marine litter. But marine litter is just one form of many problems or maladies facing the seas. Um, and I offer this because in the list of problems facing the world's oceans, litter usually doesn't rank very high until maybe about two or three years ago. 
So there are the familiar issues of climate change, rising sea level, declining fish stocks, um, and other issues such as, and I'm going to number eight, classic pollution such as heavy metals, sewage, petroleum, radioactive waste in the ocean, um, and then also recently piracy as well. So there's a long list of, of issues. Is there anybody to raise the screen? Some people in the back can't see it. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have control over that. So. All right. Sorry. So marine litter is what I want to talk about today. And litter, marine litter is basically solid waste, human-generated solid waste that end up in the ocean, seas, bays, and other waterways. Best estimates are that every year approximately 20 million metric tons of uh, marine litter enters the oceans. Roughly 80% of it is plastic, um, composed of polystyrene, polyester, polyethylene, etc., that float and break down into smaller pieces in the environment. So I'm really talking about, for most of the lecture today, and, and certainly for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, about marine litter, and specifically plastics in the ocean. I want to point out that dumping in the ocean is illegal, and it's been illegal for a very long time. And I have two of the most popular protocols, again, this is just a lot of text, but the Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution by Dumping of Waste and Other Matter, it's often called the London Dumping Convention Protocols. Um, this prohibits land-based waste on ships that for intentional dumping out to sea. 87 parties or states have signed it, um, and each member nation is responsible for regulating this, this, uh, this agreement. Then also the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, MARPOL, which means marine pollution, um, which bans the dumping of plastic and other forms of garbage at sea. 144 different parties or states have signed it. And the flagship, in other words, the flag state, whatever flag the, the ship flies, is responsible for fees and enforcement. Now, I offer that because it's technically illegal, but it's widespread. Um, and so this is a report from um, 2005 um, called Marine Litter, an Analytical Overview. And this represents um, the growing concern around the world about having wastes dumped into, or wastes that find their way into the ocean. And from the, um, pre uh, the executive summary, we see why ocean dumping of marine litter speci specifically is considered a problem. It's an environmental, economic, health, and aesthetic problem. It causes damage to wildlife, threatens marine coastal biological diversity. Um, pieces of litter can also transport invasive species between seas, Medical and sanitary waste constitute a health concern. Each year, uh, marine litter causes damage that entails great economic loss. I'm just highlighting this. And it also spoils, fouls, and destroys the beauty of the sea and the coastal zone. And that's from 2005. As recent as last, last October, the problem has really moved up in terms of concern with people around the world. And this is from um, UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles School of Law, the Emmett Center on Climate Change and Environment, which the opening um, of their policy paper on marine litter basically says, marine litter is one of the most significant problems facing the world's ocean and seas and the communities and economies that depend on them. Plastic marine litter presents a particularly significant environmental threat, as well as a considerable regulatory challenge. So in terms of policy, it's becoming an incredibly um, well-documented phenomenon, as well as a very popular phenomenon in environmental journalism. Um, I want to show you the various forms and various places uh, or, or um, ways in which marine litter enters into the ocean. Um, and so some of these, all the pictures that I'm going to show are from various reports. This one is um, from the United Nations, Atlas on the Oceans, um, and this is a, a waterway in Brazil. Um, oh, this is, well, I'm sorry, this picture I took while in Sydney. Um, here we see, this is uh, Sydney Harbor. This is right next to the famous Sydney Opera House. Um, this is in Bolos, Greece, uh, where my wife and I are vacationing uh, last summer. And so litter is all over the place, uh, unfortunately, and it has, marine litter, I should say, has two sources, ocean-based and land-based. So, Estimates are that 20 to 40 percent of marine litter that comes from ocean-based sources um, are from material that's dumped uh, overboard from merchant ships, ferries, and cruise liners, fishing vessels, military fleet research vessels, pleasure craft, offshore gas and oil platforms, and aquaculture installations. Now, you'll notice here something very important. 
estimates 20 to 40 percent. There's really no way to know exactly how much uh, waste is entering the oceans and from where because it's so ubiquitous. There's so many different points of entry into the waterways. Land-based sources, uh, estimated 60 to 80 percent of marine litter. Um, municipal landfills located on the coast, which break down, and I'm going to show you a picture of one. Uh, transport of waste along rivers and other inland waterways. Discharge of untreated municipal sewage and stormwater. Discharge from industrial facilities and tourism, people going to places and, and leaving waste behind. So here's a classic example. Uh, of a decaying landfill on the shore, and I have this, you know, sort of question: Where is it? And I know it's hard for you to see this, but um, this is, this picture was taken last summer at one of my favorite places in the world, which is Block Island in Rhode Island. Um, and so it doesn't have to be in Brazil or other nations um, in other hemispheres. Here in the United States, just as in other quote unquote developed nations, you have other points of entry for municipal solid waste. And this was, of course, a result of, excuse me, Superstorm Sandy um, and what happened in Rhode Island, as happened in many other shoreline communities, with rising tides eroded um, banks and, uh, and beaches and, and took with it, in this case, uh, part of the landfill. But most of the attention, most of the media attention um, that people or people have heard about marine litter comes from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is pretty interesting because 10 years ago, I first started noticing numerous stories about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Back in the early 90s, uh, when I was writing my dissertation, I had heard about it, um, but it really wasn't a great deal of focus in terms of the environmental media, and, I, and Garbage Magazine was part of the environmental media, so I knew about it, um, but it really wasn't identified yet as a, as a significant issue. Um, in fact, Excuse me. The National United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration (NOAA) um, discovered the patch uh, in in the late 1980s, but really didn't um, identify it as what it's become as this idea of a floating island of garbage. And so, basically, you hear in the media exaggerations, uh, which you know I'm part of this as well, um, <laughs> that the patch is made up of vast amounts of plastic, glass, and other floating debris churning endlessly in the Pacific, um, that it's huge, that it's the size of the state of Texas or Alaska. I've even seen twice the size of the continental United States. I think in the poster we put the size of Texas. That's, that's what I was hoping would get you here. Um, but NOAA is, uh, is adamant that it's not an actual floating landfill, as some people think that it is, that it's more of like a peppery flakes of soup. Um, and that's, that's probably a good way to think about it. Um, and when I, and I haven't been to the garbage patch, I've been, to, I've been to other places with garbage, but I have not been to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And when I Google searched images, this image keeps on coming up over and over and over again. And it's fishing gear, it's lost fishing gear, which is one of the more prominent parts of uh, waste that's in the garbage patch. And the garbage patch really isn't a patch, it's patches. Um, and this is uh, from NOAA. And you can see here that there are two patches, the uh, western garbage patch and the eastern garbage patch. Um, and they're floating in the great northern Pacific gyre. Um, and so these two patches um, follow the circulation of the seas. Actually, it goes this way, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a uh, clockwise motion. Um, and plastics and other floating debris will float for years and years and years and years. Some of it goes to the bottom, which I'll show you a clip in a moment. Um, and most of it, however, just floats until it wa washes up on the beaches as well. And again, this is part of the North Pacific gyre, which is over here and here. There are five gyres. There's the North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean gyre. And in each one of these are, are a great deal of floating debris and patches, so to speak. Um, this is part of the Atlantic Garbage Patch, which is just off the Canary Islands, off the coast of Africa. And let me see, do I want to show the next one? Yes, I do. Um, and not coincidentally, these patches are located around the edges of the great shipping lanes um, across the globe. And so that's very important because if there's any debris that washes overboard, it gets caught up in these gyres and churns and can end up going great distances. For example, um, container ships, if they encounter a storm, it's not uncommon during a very heavy seas uh, for containers just to go overboard uh, and to sit at the bottom of the ocean. 
but the most famous um, of this has to deal with 28,800 bath toys that went overboard from a container ship. And this is a great book, if anyone, this is by Donovan Hahn, it's called Bogey Duck. Um, and it's the story of uh, the container ship, uh, or, or a container, or several containers that broke open with 28,000 plus bath toys that floated around the world. <laughs> and um, it's called The Voyage of the Friendly Floaties, that was the name of the, of the rubber ducks. Um, and so in January 2000, I mean, excuse me, 1992, halfway through the Pacific in a storm, it fell over, and then they floated all over the world. Uh, and you can see, you know, better part um, a decade and more. Um, and I imagine there's still some floating. But that makes sense, of course, because the rubber ducks are designed to float. That's, that's their purpose, right? But from this, oceanographers were able to determine uh, trends. Um, and one in particular, Curtis Evesmeyer, he followed uh, the friendly floaties, and he was able to identify, um, along with um, a, a, a man named Captain Charlie Moore, who um, was sailing his boat through the North Pacific in the, in the 1990s, late 1990s, they began to theorize uh, the extent of this garbage patch and identified it as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So this is a very famous story. Uh, it's cute. It's a great read uh, if you want to learn how tide, tides work. Um, one of the main arguments from Donovan Hahn's book, of course, is that this is largely, even though there are protocols and treaties that are supposed to prevent dumping, it's, it's, it's largely unregulated in practice. I mean, material that goes overboard goes overboard, and there's really nothing that can be done about it. Um, and, it and it's quite fascinating. But sadly, the, now I'm going to end, this is the sad part of the lecture here. Uh, this is about the deadly nature of plastics floating in the ocean. And this is uh, remains um, in a dead baby albatross. And this comes from uh, a documentary called Midway, uh, Message in a Gyre which is about the dangers of plastics in the ocean um, and how small, in this case, birds and other forms of marine life ingest uh, plastics, mistaking it for food. Um, in fact, fulmars, which are gull, are currently being tracked in the Pacific, uh, and 95% of them that have been dissected contain plastics in their stomachs. Um, and so this is pretty widespread in certain species. Um, another concern, uh, and we'll get back to Midway in a moment, another concern um, is plastospheres, which is this growing um, body of investigation on how new ecological communities are being formed within the plastics that are floating and how um, all kinds of microbes and, and, and other species will, will, will land onto, if you will, the plastic and marine debris and will go from one habitat to another. Um, it's, this is sort of, I've seen about five stories of plastosphere in the last month as, as I was doing more work for this. I noticed a great deal of research that's come to the fore on this. So um, I've decided I'm not going to show this clip. I'll instead show the, the one from Midway. Um, but this, uh, there's a, a really interesting documentary called Plastic Paradise. Um, and the, it's made by this woman, Angela. Oh, I'm not blanking on her last name. Wait, I have it written down at a moment. <laughs> uh, Angela's son, um, and it's a, it's a clip of, from the most remote beach in the United States that, that's full of garbage and full of waste, but I think instead I will show the one from the Midway Atoll, so one moment, please. This is the trailer for the movie, and this is really this is depressing, sorry. This is from photographer Chris Johnson. This is his diagram.
have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future. an ocean of grief and beyond. Okay, so that's depressing. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, but am I going to the slideshow? Okay. Um, so this is this is one of uh, two of the other documentaries of Plastic Paradise, which are, are just now being released. Um, and it illustrates that over the last decade, that studying the Pacific Garbage Patch um, has become um, you know, the subject of, of numerous projects. Citizen uh, scientists and citizen scientists, people um, partaking in various studies of marine litter as it washes ashore, um, going on expeditions, doing work to, to investigate the extent of the patch. Um, and the other thing that um, I find fascinating is that that debris which does not float obviously makes it to the, to the bottom of the ocean. And now there are projects that are also beginning to document the extent um, of the use of the ocean bed, if you will, as a final resting ground. And, I, and I'm actually decided I'm not going to show this clip because it's, it's more or less the same by finding, um, you know, there's plastic and aluminum containers and deep sea containers at the, at the bottom of the sea. And I want to stop for a moment um, because one thing I, I, I hadn't thought I was going to mention, but I, I actually think this makes a lot of sense, is that you, the use of the ocean as a final disposal place, there really is no such thing as a final disposal place, um, is a long tradition. And so this is unintended though. This isn't something that is part of a policy of a state to say we're just going to dump it overboard. Um, in the past that has happened. But the ocean is full of various, not full, the ocean has several places and several zones that have been used in the past for dumping of radioactive waste, sewage sludge, uh, military debris, and I'm going to show you some of those in a moment. And this is my way of saying that, you know, th this isn't anything new. It just happens to be that, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, with the proliferation of plastics and disposable goods, it's now finding its way, not only into the ocean, but finding it, it's having these harmful effects on marine life and, and coming back in ways that were completely un, unanticipated. All right, so with that said, um, let's talk about the Great Lakes briefly here. Um, now, we don't have any large floating uh, patches in the Great Lakes yet, um, but I want to show you this because the Great Lakes are now, in the last two years, there have been uh, several studies on the waves and currents and, and the way in which plastics, uh, plastics float, plastics, plastics float uh, in the lakes, and uh, you know we're we're in more or less pretty good shape around the Chicago area, but Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, due to the way the currents and the waves, we'll see uh, see far more marine litter uh, than we have here. So it's now being taken seriously. Uh, this is again a project of NOAA. The Canadian government has several projects going on as well. And I'm not suggesting that we have these garbage patches in the Great Lakes. But what we do have in the Great Lakes, just like the ocean, the presence of microplastics, small plastics that have broken down um, from a variety of sources. And that does have an impact on marine life. So it is a problem in the lakes, just as it is uh, in the ocean as well. And it's this, these studies are really more or less in their infancy, so I don't, I don't have any results to, to share with you that have been reported. But just want you to know that it isn't just in the ocean that's also here. So, now the connection to urbanization. All right, well, the urban world. We live in a very unique period in, in world history because for the first time, the majority of people on the planet now live in an urban area. And I can go on for, for, for hours trying to define what an urban area is, but this is from the United Nations, and if we break down the principal regions of the world, we see 
that urbanization is increasing, but some places are more urban than others, are increasing, ur urbanizing, I should say, at different rates. Excuse me. Um, Africa, we have almost 40% of Africa is urban, 45% of Asia, 73% of Europe, 79% of Latin American Caribbean, 82% of North America, and 70% of Oceania, which includes Australia and New Zealand, which are actually more urban. But it becomes clear when I show this next slide. Here we have percentage urban and uh, agglomerations by size. So this area, we see the colors here, the blue it means it's heavily urbanized. And we see Australia, uh, North and South America, Europe, parts of Africa, uh, and Japan are the most urban, large urban nations on the planet. This, this all gets very confusing when trying to determine what's urban. Uh, and social scientists usually, what they're talking about is population size. The growth of a specific area um, at the rate of growth of an area and the processes that contribute to the growth. And so that's sort of a generalized way to talk about urbanization. And the big concern that many public policy um, and environmental policy um, advocates have is that most of the urbanization that's taking place in the world is taking place along the shoreline. Within 100 miles of the shore, half the people in the world live in cities, more than half. And oops, is that like <laughs> screwing the clip? Um, and half the people in the world also live within 100 miles of the ocean. So the concern, of course, is that these large cities, especially in um, areas that don't have a great deal of um, infrastructure development, are going to create these large mega cities that are full of the same problems that existed in the 19th century in the United States and Europe. And so what do I mean by all of that? All right, let me show you. So um, this is this is a dump uh, in uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and I want to think, thank my colleague, Dr. Trina Hope. Trina's here. She told me uh, about this specifically. And I want to show you a clip of, um, and this is also depressing, I'm sorry, uh, but I want to show you a clip about conditions of life in Freetown, and specifically Crow Bay. Eighteen hundred kids die every day from unclean water. As tragic as the wars that are going on worldwide, it's very rare that you hear about eighteen hundred people dying every day in any war zone. Kube in Freetown, Sierra Leone is an example of these battle zones that are around the world. It's sewage everywhere. Children are bathing in, in what is known as the Crocodile River that runs through the neighborhood. And I was told there was seven places to find clean water uh, within the neighborhood. And so this is, a, this is a photo of a young man who ran out of clean water and who was gonna go around here and finish his shower. You just look at this stairwell of, of water and garbage, and you wonder, where is he going? Kids would walk outside their front door with a, a small metal can and a bar of soap, and they would just literally walk right into this horrible, dark water. These kids lived about 500 feet down the river. A half an hour later, a little boy bathed right here. In this case, even the teddy bear is, is injured. There has been great successes since the early 1990s with maternal infant mortality and access to clean water. Absolutely. But when 600 women are dying a day and 1,800 kids are dying a day, how is this not a crisis? So, with that, I'm here to say, as bad as all this is, we've seen it before, and there are lessons from the past that can be used to help us deal with what, you know, if, if that factoid is correct, that we're dumping uh, 
three times as much garbage and rubbish into the ocean as fish taken out. And one logical conclusion is that that doesn't stop, of course. We're going to have these oceans as dead zones of garbage. Um, so let me go back to New York City. Let's go back to New York City in the late 19th century. And this is the focus of my dissertation. And in the late 19th century, the city of New York, like many cities that were urbanizing, uh, are growing and becoming large cities, um, went through a period of what we would consider very poor, but horrific sanitation in very poor conditions. And so in late 19th century New York City, there were people who also lived in dumps, and very much lived in dumps, like people are living in dumps today in other parts of the de de developing nations. Um, and this is a sketch of um, people, and this is families, it's, it's, a hard, it's hard to see this, I understand that. But down here are men, women, and occasionally children who are picking through the garbage uh, of the city, looking for scraps that they can resell and, and trying to make a living off the waste. Now, from here on in, I'll, this gets a little more humorous, but the city of New York, um, beginning in the 1850s and 1860s, began to increasingly rely upon dumping of garbage into the ocean. Now, New York City is, a, it is built on a harbor, one of the nation's best harbors. But every year, um, some of the waste dumped out to sea would come floating back. It only makes sense. Um, and so, beginning in the, especially in the 1880s, from the 1880s to the 1920s, the city of New York tried, at times desperately, to stop the dependence upon dumping in the ocean. And as much as the city did not want to dump in the ocean, and as much as its neighbors did not want to dump in the ocean, the city had no choice. There were, there were few alternatives, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. This is a cartoon from, um, uh, this was from Puck Magazine, um, and it's the last day they're close of the bathing season at Manhattan Beach, and, and this becomes part of the city of New York later on, but in 1880 it's, it's separate from New York City. And it illustrates the real problem that during the summertime, as people were going to the shore to enjoy the shore for recreation, they occasionally had to face, this is, I'm sorry, this one doesn't look very good, but here's a, here's a photograph that's, so this is Coney Island. But this is um, garbage washing ashore near Rockaway Beach in New York City. So in the 19th century, in the late 19th century especially, some cities in America dumped in the ocean. But New York earned a reputation for being one of the filthiest and for that garbage actually coming back with the tides. And it was a very serious public policy issue. I don't have time to get into all of it. But there was a point at which the harbor it was recognized that the harbor was filling up from garbage and that this actually could threaten the economic livelihood of the city. Um, but a solution was found in the late 19th, or 1896, 95, 96, um, where the city began to slowly recycle, and then by the turn of the century, um, from 1900 to 1918 or so, it recycled a great deal of material, and so ocean dumping was not as a, a, a big a deal. But there were transformations in the marketplace, which made um, the recycling materials too expensive. So beginning just, just after the First World War, uh, into the early 1930s, the city went back to dumping in uh, what's called the Bight of New York, which is the, the waters off the coast of New York and New Jersey as the coastline bends. Um, and so the city created a very elaborate infrastructure uh, and systems for disposing of garbage, uh, disposing garbage in the ocean. And what's very interesting is that the city kept claiming that even though it wanted to stop the practice, that it really wasn't co coming back to the shore in um, a large amount, a large volume, if you will. Um, but they kept investing money on trying to take the garbage 20 I think 22 miles out to sea was as far as the city would take it on a daily basis to dump it. But it would keep, it would keep coming back and coming to shore. Go away. So finally, in the 1920s, the state of New Jersey had had enough. And the state of New Jersey filed suit against the city of New York, claiming that floating islands of garbage were destroying the shoreline. And indeed they were, in terms of destroying the shoreline as viable, viable for vacation, for people going to... Atlantic Beach or enjoying the shoreline. And this is one of the more remarkable instances uh, in American, um, it was my, my wife is a political scientist, she calls it federalism, uh, where the federal government takes over to solve a public policy dispute. And in, in the early 1930s, the United States Supreme Court said, you know what, you have to stop this to the city, to the city of New York. This is a nuisance, this is destroying the quality of life for people living on the, uh, the shores of New Jersey. And it's a, it's a health nuisance as well. And what is amazing is the, the amount of